Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while to talk about what? Talk about the Bible. Oh, my, that wonderful book that God has given us. And any time we have an opportunity to read the Bible, we should grab hold of it because there's nothing more important or exciting or wonderful than the Bible. Oh, I know, I know, we start reading the Bible and we don't understand a lot of what we read, but we keep praying as, we, as we're reading, we pray for wisdom and above all, pray for obedience to that what we do understand because that should be the real desire of every one of us, that we want to be obedient to what God has declared. He is the creator of the world. He rules the world. He is the judge of all the world. And that means every human being has to answer to him. But at the same time, he is also the Savior. He is the one who has provided a way in which we can have the more abundant life. We can have utopia, to use an old word. Uh, we can have the highest bliss, the highest blessing possible. And uh, this is what the Bible discloses to us. And these are the kind of things that we talk together about on this program. Now, we uh, received a letter from, uh, from uh, India, India, asking a question from Galatians chapter 3. The question actually is when we are not perfect in our bodies, why in Galatians chapter 3 verse 3 does it say, are ye so foolish? Well, let's look at that passage for a moment because it, like everything else in the Bible, is of real significance. And it starts out in verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath evidently been set forth? and is crucified uh, so that you know he was crucified among you. <laughs> Excuse me. This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are ye so foolish? This is verse 3. Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? You see, here is the problem. The Bible teaches that the only way we can become saved is by the action of God, the Holy Spirit, applying the Word of God to our lives and making us a child of God. And this is by the faith of the Lord Jesus. The fact that He was absolutely faithful in uh, making all the arrangements and make, paying the penalty demanded by the law of God uh, so that we might be, uh, that God might be able to forgive our sins and make us his children. And here at the, in the church at Galatia, uh, this is the kind of teaching that they began to receive. Uh, they uh, heard the truth that it's all by the Spirit. It is all by God himself. But because of the rebellious nature of man, the ego of man, the pride of man, they began to fall into the snare, into the trap that most congregations of our day and most theologians and Bible teachers have fallen into, Namely, oh no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, if we do certain things, this we, we can then know that we can become saved. We know that we can get ourselves saved. If we, uh, if, if we have faith, if we begin to believe on the Lord Jesus, if we call upon his name, if we repent of our sins, 
if we uh, reach out and accept him, if we uh, uh, get baptized in water, if we pray a certain kind of prayer, if we make a profession of faith in our church, and so on and so on, if we do any of these things or all of them, uh, certainly that can join up with the work that Christ did in paying for our sins, and uh, so we can know for sure that I can become saved. And what we've done is we've departed from the work of the uh, the, fa the teaching and the, and the fact of the matter that uh, our salvation is dependent 100% upon the work of Christ. 100% upon the activity of God. We are spiritually dead and there's no way that we will ever seek God of ourselves on on God's terms, that just will not happen. And and uh, uh, even if we were seeking God, the fact is we uh, we uh, well we can't because we're spiritually dead. And no man can come to me, Jesus said, unless the Father draw him. And so we have fallen into utter foolishness. We have departed from the salvation plan that God had set forth and set up our own, our own man-made plan. And this is what God is, is reminding us. We, like the Galatians, if we have a uh, do-it-yourself salvation plan, have become very foolish. We are not reading the Bible carefully, and we're not ready to follow the Bible the way God tells us we are to follow it. And so we are setting up a salvation plan that will never, never bring salvation. Oh, we can be convinced we have become saved. We can be told by our pastor or whoever it is that is uh, uh, trying to get us saved that, oh, now you've done this and that and the other thing, and therefore I know that you've become a child of God. No, they can't know that. They can't know that at all. And yet we can be encouraged that way, but the fact is, we are utterly foolish. The only wise way is to say, Oh, Lord, I don't understand it all, but I know that I can't do anything to get myself saved. I know that I have to be one of God's elect, and I don't know whether I'm one of God's elect. And I wasn't there to choose me when the, uh, God chose those who... He planned to save already before he ever created the world at all. And I certainly had nothing to do with putting my sins on the Lord Jesus Christ, which had to happen, and he had to pay for those sins. And uh, I had nothing to do with that. And I had nothing to do with the enormous miracle of God applying the word of, my, of God to my heart so that I would become a child of God. Oh, Lord, all I know is I'm a sinner, and I don't deserve salvation. Have mercy, have mercy. And I'm just glad, oh, Lord, that thou art a merciful God. And maybe, maybe I too can experience thy mercy. And anything other than that is foolishness. Well, thank you, India, for that. Uh, our, our question and now shall we go to our first caller on our telephone lines good evening welcome to open forum uh good evening brother yes um i want to i was just curious uh how should a christian view the tragic loss of a loved one how should a christian view the which the tragic loss of a loved one a like tragic a loss right. well uh First of all, we know that a, a, a true believer knows that God is in charge of every event. God has allowed this to happen, whatever it did happen, as difficult as it may have been. God has allowed it, and, and uh, we are, are thankful that God is on the throne and that he is in charge. Uh, secondly, we don't know whether that loved one was a child of God, perhaps, or not, but we do know that God does everything perfectly. And, uh, and uh, if, if uh, our loved one was a child of God, we know that they are now in heaven, and we could rejoice in that. 
But if we have no idea about that, we, uh, we still know that God does everything perfectly, and we can rest on that because our God is in charge of these things. And, and uh, you know, uh, the fact that he is in charge is a great comfort to us because it means that while it appears like that tragic thing may have been an accident or it may have been because of man's uh, cruelty to someone or whatever, uh, the fact is that God, that it happened indicates that this fits also into God's plan. And now, uh, but there's one last thing, and this is even more important than everything else. This tragic thing happened to my loved one or my friend, and uh, it's a reminder how short life is. What if that had been me? What if that had been me that had died? Where would I be? Would I be with Christ or would I be in silence awaiting the resurrection of the last day to stand for judgment? And so uh, the, the best thing that can happen uh, out of a tragic thing like that is that it's a reminder to us, make sure that you are a child of God. And, and how do we make sure? Well, we examine our life. Yeah, do I really find that I have a great desire to do the law, keep the commandments of God? And I'm, I delight in the Word of God. It's, I'm happiest when I'm doing the will of God. And if I don't find that in my life, it means that I, I can be thankful that I know that probably I'm not saved and I can still cry to God for mercy while it is still the day of salvation. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, what day in the year 2011 do you expect the world to come to an end? Well, you know, uh, it's probably my judgment is that, uh, based on what I can know of the Bible presently, is that it probably will be in the fall of the year. But insofar as the day or the hour, I, I, there's not enough information in the Bible for me to determine that. I simply I believe that it'll probably, if, if that is the year, if everything holds together the way uh, presently I see the pattern, uh, it means that uh, it would probably be in the fall of the year. I see. May I ask you another question? Yes. Uh, the southern kingdom was composed, I believe, of uh, the tribes of Judah, Simeon, and Benjamin. Uh, so that means that the other ten tribes of, of Israel were the lost tribes? No, there are no such a thing as lost tribes. That is a, a, a statement that was concocted by these, the uh, uh, writers who are fantasy, the fantasy writers. You know, there are always people who are trying to spin a yarn of one kind or another. Uh, and uh, they base, uh, they get a few facts together and then do a lot of speculation and and uh, can write a, a, an interesting narrative and maybe they maybe uh, later on somebody write, reads their narrative and and gives some credit uh, to truth in it and picks up the ideas and and develops it some more until pretty soon we have a whole lot of uh, ideas floating around that have no basis in fact at all there are no lost tribes the fact is that the ten tribes Upon the destruction of, uh, of Israel, the ten tribes to the north, uh, 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 which uh, uh, were destroyed in the year 709 B.C. by the Assyrians, uh, the remnants of those tribes joined with Judah and Benjamin, which made up the uh, kingdom of Judah, and that continued until the year 587 B.C. when it was destroyed by the Babylonians and the remnants from the, from, uh, uh, the nation of Judah, which also included the remnants that had come out of, out of the northern ten tribes, 
uh, they lived in Babylon, and uh, then in the year 539 B.C., or shortly thereafter, uh, they began to uh, return back to Jerusalem. There were about 40 or 45,000 people that returned uh, about that time and began to build uh, the nation of Israel again in the land of Israel, and that continued that way until Christ came. I see. So what you're saying is that the southern kingdom was composed of Judah and Simeon and Benjamin? Judah and Benjamin, not Simeon. Simeon I see. was part of the ten tribes to the north. I see. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. How are you doing this evening? Very well, thank you. Um... A couple nights ago, you were talking about Lazarus and Jesus raising him from the dead. Um, my first question is, wasn't Lazarus a true believer? And that's one of the reasons why Jesus brought him up from the dead. Right. And my second question is... Oh, excuse me. Let me ask you. Would you repeat your question? Was it because Lazarus was which? Uh, I can't hear you very uh, well. Repeat your question, please. Um... My question was, you you were talking about Lazarus a couple of nights ago, yes. probably about four nights ago, and you were talking about using the whole Bible to understand certain things. And uh, so one of the things you were talking about was that um, you were talking about Lazarus uh, and Jesus raising him from the dead. And I... I just kind of noticed that you didn't tell the whole story of Lazarus, and he was a believer. I know he was. He's, he's he, uh, you know, what the Bible tells us anyway. And is that the reason why Jesus was able to raise him from the dead? Because he was a true believer, a true believer in Christ. And my second question is, um, I know I can't do anything to be saved, but isn't the one thing I'm supposed to do, and the only thing I can do? is uh, read the Bible and get into his word. I mean, you always talk about not being able to do anything, but that is the one thing I think, and I think every true believer should believe, is that the Bible is the same thing I need to understand. And I'll take my answer on, off the air. Thanks. Yeah, well, let me answer the second question first. The fact is that uh, the Bible is the environment in which God saves. Now, because somebody reads the Bible, that doesn't mean it guarantees he is going to become saved. Uh, we have no guarantees like that because we, we don't know whether we're one of God's elect or not. But if, we're, but if we're serious about our desire that we might become saved, uh, we certainly want to be in an environment where God can save us if that is his plan to do so. And, uh, and uh, the fact that we've been reading the Bible did not do any work toward getting us saved. It was simply putting us in an environment uh, where uh, God says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And that word faith actually is... Uh, uh, virtually the word Christ because Christ is the very essence of faith. In fact, we could translate or paraphrase that Christ cometh by uh, hearing and hearing by the word of God as we are under the hearing of the word of God. And it isn't because of what we understand from the Bible. It's simply that God has, has decided in his own divine providence that when he saves someone, it will be in the environment of the Word of God. And that's why we tell people all over the world, please read the Bible, get into the Word of God. And, and in fact, there's a great blessing already because you begin to learn about God. You begin to learn about Judgment Day and Hell and the wrath of God and the terribleness of your sins. You begin to learn that uh, Christ is the only one who can save and that he has to do all the work to save you and so on. And, uh, and you learn that God is a, is a, uh, a, 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 a merciful God and you can cry to him for mercy, but you have no guarantee 
none that you're going to get saved. You have to, we have to wait upon God. Uh, maybe he will have mercy on me too. And that's, that uh, is, uh, uh, that is uh, emphasizing that we have to, God has to do everything about our salvation. And he, if we do become saved, he receives all the glory. Now, insofar as Lazarus was concerned, we know he was a true believer. We know this because the Bible says that Jesus loved him. And he hates sinners, but he loves those that, ha that have become saved. We are his beloved. And, uh, and uh, he raised Lazarus not because Lazarus was a believer, but because he used Lazarus as a picture of what salvation is. Uh, he, uh, whether Lazarus was a believer or not, would not have changed the picture that Christ was painting, uh, the portrait he was painting, as he takes this dead, stinking corpse and commands that stinking corpse to come forth and, uh, and uh, come to physical life. And as we look at that very carefully, we see there a dramatic portrait of how God saves those that he plans to save. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, I have two questions. The first is uh, in Luke 21, verse 25. Luke 21, verse 25, we read, And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's heart failing them for fear and for looking after those things which were coming, are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, I don't, uh, you're, uh, uh, well, uh, let me ask you this. What is your question about this? Yeah, uh, where it says, and there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars. Is that something that's going to happen right immediately before Christ returns? Uh, probably so. I don't really understand these verses. I do know in, uh, in uh, Matthew 24, we get information, a uh, similar statement, but that this, what is ha speaking, being spoken about here in Luke, takes place after the Great Tribulation, and the Great Tribulation is the last event before the end of the world. So we read in uh, Matthew 24, where um, uh, in verse... Uh, uh, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. So this is happening immediately after the time of great tribulation, but but I, uh, God does not give enough information that I've been able to find to give us any delineation of that. Uh, uh, we just have to wait and see how that's all going to develop. Okay. And can now you look at uh, Revelation 13, verse 18? Revelation 13, and verse 8, and in Revelation 18. 13. Pardon? Verse 18. Verse 18? Yes. Revelation 13, verse 18. Uh, there we read, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of man and of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6. Is that your verse? Yes. Yeah. And, and this is uh, speaking, the beast is Satan. Uh, the, uh, he is typified as a beast. And, the, and uh, uh, he identifies with the unsaved of the world, who in turn identify with the two-thirds 
that God use, uh, speaks of in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 8, where symbolically he divides the human race into two parts. These are not, not uh, actual parts, but symbolical parts, where the, those who are true believers are under the, uh, the figure of one-third, and those who remain unsaved are under the figure of two-thirds, and when you write two-thirds as a decimal, it's point six 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 six. And if you write the first three numbers, you get 666. And that is a number God has assigned to the unsaved of the world who will remain unsaved and who are under the authority of Satan. And did, did I ever hear you say that number six does represent man in the Bible? I don't think so. I think six represents work because it was on the Christ work for six days. And if we had to assign it any kind of spiritual value, I would I would probably think of it uh, in the in the context of, of of work, whereas seven is a number that God uses uh, for perfect completeness and and uh, and of course. Uh, on the seventh day, we were not to do any work whatsoever. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Harold. Um, I have a question about, I heard Dr. Jack Manzella on Family Radio recently, and he referred to the church. I was wondering, as a, as a positive thing, like playing sports at the church, and I was wondering what your thoughts were considering that he's on family radio. Well, I'm sorry. I'm not aware of uh, what you're speaking. All I can know is is that uh, on family radio, we try to be as faithful uh, in all the messages that are given by whoever gives it. But sometimes a statement is made that may not be as faithful. We, we overlooked it somehow. But the fact is the only church that God is dealing with today is the eternal church. All those who have uh, truly uh, become saved uh, become citizens of the eternal church, which coincides therefore perfectly with the eternal kingdom of God. Okay. And I have another question about wine. I understand that wine is not for kings. However, did... Excuse me. Hold on. I'll be right back with you. Continuing with the open forum, we have a caller on the line. Go ahead with your call. Yes, I want. I understand that wine is not for kings, um, but did not didn't Jesus drink wine and make wine? And he certainly is a king. No, we well he did make wine. He did not drink wine. There's no evidence, and he would not have drunk wine because uh, he was both the high priest as well as the king. And when the priests were going about their duties they were not to drink wine or strong drink and neither were kings and so he would have uh, not drunk wine uh, on either score now he did turn the water into wine at the wedding of Cana of Galilee we read about that in John chapter 2 because he there was giving us a picture of the gospel that those who were at the wedding feast were typifying uh, the true believers who will sit down at the wedding feast of the bride and the lamb and the wine there was a picture of the of the uh, blood of Christ that uh, that is the fact that he gave his life and made it possible to be present there at the wedding feast mm. okay my, my last question is about the manger scene at Christmas time. Yes. Is that violating the commandments, having a baby manger, a baby Jesus in a manger? Well, the Bible says don't make any representation of God. Was Jesus eternal God when he was a little baby? Yes. Yes, he was. So if you're going to have a manger scene, don't have anything in the crib or in the manger. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. Yes. Yes, I had a question. I, uh, don't you think that maybe Christians should boycott the movie The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? 
You know, the problem is that our job as Christians is not to put down evil. There's evil everywhere. There's evil uh, every place we turn, and there are those who have the idea that we have to crusade against evil in one way or another. But we can't put down evil. God is the one who has to change man's heart so that they will not do wickedly any longer. Our job is simply to remind the world that we, this is an evil world. It's populated by wicked people and that all of us by nature are under the wrath of God. But wonderfully, there is, and there is a judgment day coming, but wonderfully, there is also the possibility of salvation. And that's our task. But to crusade or to boycott or anything like that, against evil no that's never never the role of the true believers brother campy yes um when is the thousand year reign of christ supposed to take place oh well that uh, uh, that's a theological idea the fact is that christ uh, has been reigning uh, that term one thousand years the word of one thousand is used frequently in the Bible to indicate completeness and he uh, when he arose from the grave we read in Ephesians chapter 1 he sat down at the right hand of God and was given authority over everything in this age and in the age to come and the thousand years are the, are the complete period of time going all the way through the church age when he was reigning in the local congregations and uh, so it is uh, that's that's past tense now okay thank you thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum yes how you doing very well thank you oh, could you uh, explain luke 17 verse 20 for me and i'll take it off the air luke 17 verse 24 20 Reverse 20. Yes. Luke 17. I'll take it off the air. All right. Luke 17, verse 20. Let's look at that a moment. Luke 17, verse 20. There we read. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said... The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo, here or lo, there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Yes, you see, the kingdom of God consists of all the true believers. Now, the uh, Jews of Jesus' day were looking for a visible kingdom, which... Uh, they wanted Jesus, as a matter of fact, to be their king, to head them up, to free them from Roman rule. Very much like the premillennialists uh, uh, the, who hold the premillennialist doctrines uh, came up with the idea that Christ would reign as a king uh, from Jerusalem on his present world for a thousand years. They wanted a political king someone that can be seen and that would therefore uh, all those who followed that king would be in, an integral part of the kingdom but this but God is saying no no that isn't the kingdom it is within you that is uh, the kingdom of God consists of every true believer when we truly have become saved that is we've been given a brand new resurrected soul by God in which we never want to sin again and that the result of that is we have an intense desire to be obedient to everything and anything in the Bible which is the complete law of God and that is the kingdom and and we enter that kingdom at the moment we become saved but we can't see it by observation we can look at a congregation for example that is not the eternal kingdom of God. Oh, yes, there may be some individuals within that congregation who are truly saved. Only God knows who they are, and they are citizens of the eternal kingdom. 
But just because the others made a profession of faith or accepted Jesus or whatever, that doesn't mean that they have become saved. And and so we can't see the uh, the kingdom of God literally. That is, it, it does not come by observation, but it is within you. That is within the lives of those who have truly become believers. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Camping. Yes. Yes, um, and uh, I'd like for you to turn to Matthew 19. Matthew 19, yes, in which verse? Verse 5. Matthew 19, verse 5. Uh, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Now, what is your question? My question is, is if, if um, you've been married for 12 years or something, and your spouse decides to go off and fool around, do you consider that as a, as a divorce? Or, because Jesus did say, except it be for fornication, you can divorce. Well, no, uh, that's what the church teaches, but the Bible doesn't teach that, that you can divorce for fornication. Well, does Bible, Jesus what say that? Excuse me, excuse me, what does it say here? He said, uh, uh, let's look at, look at uh, 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 verse 4. Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife? and they too shall be one flesh. And in another place, and then he said in verse 6, What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Christ is God now, and he's laying down the law. These are the rules of God for the human race. He spelled them right out here, that there is not to be divorced. And he reiterates this, for example, in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39, where God there uh, further develops that law by stating that, uh, that the wife is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. And so if she divorces, she is still bound to him, or if she is divorced, she is bound to him. In other words, uh, it is not God's intention that there is to be divorce for any reason whatsoever. Okay, okay. okay. What about is the, is the spouse allowed to see other people or no? The I'm one who, I'm who, telling who is the, is the innocent spouse, the husband or the wife, whatever. Are they allowed to see other people after their divorce? Like as friends, see other people as well after the fact, divorce. The fact is that uh, if anyone is divorced, however they got divorced, they can say they're innocent and, and maybe they aren't quite as uh, are guilty as the one who divorced them uh, but, uh, or who uh, committed adultery or whatever, but the divorce is wrong. Uh, in God's eyes, that person, that husband and wife are still married and, there's not, and as long as the, the uh, that person is uh, uh, spouse is living uh, if uh, there is not to be another marriage, and so that means that the moment that that one who has been divorced, and even though they claim that they're innocent, begins to romance somebody else, uh, then they are uh, moving in a direction of terrible sin because they're setting up. Uh, the temptation to want to get married, and you can't do that if you're going to follow the law of God. Okay. Thank you for calling you. and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Um, I I have two questions. Yes. Um, in ancient Israel, I've been studying that um, they're supposed to have long beards, and I don't know what is the meaning. And um, I, I'm sorry, would you say that again? They're supposed to have one which? No, they had long beards. They had long beards. Yes, and I don't know why. And uh, also my second question is that on the Ten Commandments, does it apply in our times to write 
down the commandment where uh, the first commandment, like uh, on a piece of paper in front of your door, uh, or yes, don't try to put that um, like a posters. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, the teaching that they were supposed to have long beards in the Old Testament. Uh, I don't know where you read that. Uh, it is uh, there is one passage where uh, they talked about plucking out the hair, uh, and presumably it's talking about the Lord Jesus. But uh, oh, uh, and it's on. Um, I think it's Kings when uh, he sent two of his servants to. Uh, I forgot, but he's like. Um, okay, I'm not gonna say nothing. Okay, yeah. well, they so kings, uh, the all the ancient kings didn't have long beards. Yeah, well, the the first of all, <laughs> it was not easy to shave off hair, and so most men unquestionably had beards because uh, we have clean shaven people because we have marvelous. Shaving, uh, shaving tools that we can use, but that was not available back then. It was quite a, uh, to, uh, to have a clean face was virtually impossible. Everybody had a beard. But I don't know of any command in the Bible that, that commanded a person to have a long beard. I don't, I don't know that that exists anywhere in the Bible. Now, your other question again was, um, on the Ten Commandments, um, in ancient East Israel, they, uh, God commanded um, to have a poster in front of your house and to have a poster um, like in, in, in the place where your kids can see. Yeah. It's the first commandment, like, you should love God with all your heart and with all your soul and mind. Well, they were admonished to have... Uh uh, have it frontlets on their uh, uh, on their forehead uh, as frontlets on their foreheads and as uh, I don't know I don't remember the exact language but it was language that uh, we don't follow today that was all part of God's ceremonial law but it was to indicate that our eyes should always be focused on the law of God now the law of God is not just the Ten Commandments it's the whole Bible. We ought to be thinking about the Bible uh, and, and uh, reading the Bible and being concerned about what the Bible is teaching. fact is, a, uh, an explanation can be found where, uh, in Psalm 119, where God speaks about the Bible and uh, calling it the law of good of God or the commandments of God or the precepts of God. And, uh, for example, he said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might, uh, uh, might not sin against thee. What word is that? All the commandments of the Bible. That is the whole Bible. How are we going to hide it in our hearts? By reading it and reading it and pondering it. We read, for example, in Psalm 119, verse 9, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Uh, and with my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. And these are the kind of statements that uh, were in uh, to be uh, seen in these literal commands uh, to put the law, write the law as frontlets on your uh, on your eyes, it was actually to demonstrate we want uh, the commandments of God to be as close as possible to our life because that is the way we are to learn about God. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. How are you? Very well, thank you. Mr. Camping, Luke 19 from 12 to 26 is the parable of the pounds the five pounds the ten pounds the one pound yes and in john 21 15 through 17 jesus tells peter to feed his sheep are they speaking of the same thing of bringing the gospel uh well the pound the parable of the pounds have to do 
Yes, they uh, ultimately they are speaking of the same thing. The pounds means that someone has been given the gospel, and if we have truly become saved, we're going to turn around and be obedient to God to share that gospel with others so that if there is... Uh, there is uh, fruit coming or there is uh, uh, an increase uh, because others have become saved and so that yes and that's exactly what the command to feed my sheep is that we feed uh, those whom God plans to save with the word of God good I have another question yeah last week you were in your morning Bible study and you were mentioning long hair now I don't have like long, long hair, but here in the Northeast, I mean, I know you're familiar, you come here in October, but in the middle of January, it could be zero, like for days at a time. I mean, is it sinful to grow your hair like long enough to keep the back of your neck covered? I don't know of any law in the Bible that says you can't do that. I, 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 I the Bible does say, and, and I'm not sure about that command of, First uh, Corinthians 11. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. Is it, uh, even nature teaches you that it's a shame for a man to have long hair. I, I, the best that I can think about for that is that uh, it does say that hair has been given to a woman as her glory. And, uh, and the woman is a picture of the bride of Christ, the, the, uh, those who uh, are the true believers. And the hair that, uh, that, is her glory is a picture of the covering that we have because Christ has covered all of our sins, uh, and uh, that I, I believe is what First Corinthians 11 is particularly focusing on. However, there's another element that may enter into this, and that God is that is that uh, a man is not to wear women's clothing and women a men's clothing. Uh, that is, uh, and the principle of that is we are to be content with the way God has created us. If I am a woman, then I should uh, respect the idea I am a woman, dress like a woman, and, and be thankful to be a woman. If I'm a man, likewise, I should do it, uh, 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 be thankful that I am a man. Now, when a man wears long hair, that is, he has... He's trying to mimic what a woman has. A woman can grow her hair uh, down to her waist, maybe, but uh, and uh, when a man is trying to do that, uh, it at least and and I'm not I'm not saying this dogmatically at all because, but I, at least I see this possibility. He effectively is saying he'd like to have hair like a woman, and that the hair is his glory, like a woman, the hair is his glory. Now, God does not give us any rules as to how we are to cut our hair or whether it's to be this long or that long. But I think the principle has to do with why am I doing this? Is that my hair my glory? Like a woman's hair can be her glory. Uh, that is, do I secretly wish that I were a woman? Uh, that, that perhaps can shine through there. But, More quick question. Yes. We are supposed to go to our families for Christmas. Would would that, you know, going, I mean, obviously you're going to go there to celebrate Christmas. I mean, nowhere in the Bible that says thou shall remember Christmas Day to keep it holy, but it does say remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And since they're both on Sunday, would I be too insulting if I kept my family away? Well, this is a problem uh, this year because uh, the 25th of December is on Christmas, and you are absolutely correct. Christmas, the celebration of Christmas, or the selection of a day to celebrate Christmas, is not a holy day in any sense. That is, it is not a day uh, that has been set apart by God's command, whereas the Sunday as the Sabbath, is a holy day oh, yeah, absolutely it is a holy day and we should keep that in mind now in uh, many families what they are doing is that they're just uh, celebrating observing sunday as a normal day and actually celebrating christmas on monday so that there's no confusion about this that is the best solution that i'm aware of so i'd be in good shape if i did it saturday and had our regular fellowship sunday 
That would be excellent. Why not? Good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mr. Camping. Talk to you next month. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. God bless you, Brother Camping. How are you doing this evening? Very well, thank you. And, and uh, my family and I really enjoy the ministry, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the spring over in New Jersey. Um, I have a question. I've always wondered, you know, in the Bible it says to be absent from the body uh, and to be present with the Lord. Um, what are the believers that are now, um, you know, deceased and have gone on to be with the Lord? What are they? What are they doing right now? And how does that relate to in Revelation, where the, it says in the Word of God that you know, in the when we're in the new heaven and new earth, we're going to forget the former things of this life. Well, the uh, what they are doing in heaven, the Bible doesn't disclose, but we know that they are in heaven. Uh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we know that it's all joy, and uh, we, while the Bible doesn't specifically say that once they get into heaven, they, the, the former things are not remembered or come into mind, uh, that, that statement is found in Isaiah uh, relating to the new heaven and the new earth when oh, this world is all finished. So we have to, we, we have to leave that alone because God does not give us enough information okay that's that's good now also in um I, we know that you know um the pictures of uh when we about the sea and like in the red sea when the israelites crossed the red sea and when um you know with noah and the ark as the, was going through the sea it's always a picture of going through hell um, and I guess the Bible, you know, is, is kind of uh, explicit on that matter. Now, the fact that the Lord is not going to create a sea as we know it in the new heavens and the new earth, is that just a picture of that we have overcome that and now, you know, there is no, where there's no more judgment that we have to uh, worry about any longer? I think that's about what the best we can do with that. We, uh, and uh, probably that is what God is indicating because the sea is used as a picture of uh, being under the wrath of God and once we're in the new heaven and the new earth there will never again be wrath brought against anyone in that new heaven and the new earth we will be eternally there in perfect bliss and and will never fall into sin will never be tempted into sin will never come under the wrath of God therefore spiritually there is no sea. I think we, I, I think we can be fairly confident of, of that understanding. There may be some other that we're not aware of. Now, I, I had a discussion with a relative of mine about the verse in Isaiah about that talks about um, uh, by his stripes we were healed, and I, I was trying to point out to her that the, the healing that. Like, that Christ has in mind is, is about salvation, and it's not all about physical healing. Um, there's a lot of, you know, teaching these days that talk about, you know, uh, that the believers were promised physical healing, and my point to her was that believers die each and every day, and, and, and that wasn't promised to us. If the Lord chooses to to make someone well, uh, you know, via the doctors or medicine, he'll do so, but if he doesn't, it doesn't diminish what he does. Well, the fact is that if physical healing it was the point of the gospel, then it is a total failure. It is a, a, an enormous disaster because even uh, everybody eventually, as you've indicated, does die and uh, if Christ doesn't come first. Uh, and and we always die of something failing in our body, uh, and that's what sickness is, and uh, and ill health is. And but wonderfully, it is talking about a disease that is infinitely more terrible, the disease of sin, and uh, that has been paid for for in the life of the true believer, so that we have eternal life. We will never, never have to get experience the consequences of our sin which is typified by physical 
the illness that ends up in physical death. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Polly Camping. How are you? Very well, thank you. Okay, my name is Medaris, and I have a question about Christmas. Is it a real holiday, or is it a pagan holiday? Oh, it is uh, It is uh, a holiday designed by man. It has no, no biblical... Uh, uh, in, in, statement about it it doesn't it's not wrong to celebrate it as a special day it's not wrong not to celebrate it as a special day each one can make their own decision on that and and be in accord with the word of god but let's pause right now for this message we're continuing with the open forum and shall we take our call good evening hello, hello? yes yes um, I, was, I, I wanted to also ask you, um, if I'm not mistaken, isn't it somewhere in the Bible where it states that we are not to call an earthly man our father, only the one that's in heaven? Yes, that's, uh, that's in the Gospel of Matthew, call no man father. Now, it doesn't mean that we, uh, like we uh, are born of, a, of an earthly father, and we can call him father, of course. But the idea is that uh, we are not to look upon someone as a uh, substitute for God. God, the, our Heavenly Father, is the one who is the giver of every good and perfect gift. Uh, and and uh, th those who uh, uh, want to be called Father because they are dispensing spiritual blessing. They can offer you forgiveness if you confess to them and so on they are violating the bible dreadfully because they are trying to place themselves in the place of god the father and that is all wrong uh, um what chapter in matthew is that in well i'm not sure that i have that uh, 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 i i don't i just don't know offhand uh, it's I haven't looked at it recently. Uh, maybe someone else will call in uh, before the program is ended oh. and give us that oh. reference. Okay, then. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hi. Uh, question regarding Genesis. I believe it's 126. Yes, uh, let us make man after in our image, after in our likeness. Right. When when they what is that? Who is he speaking of in regards to? Let us. Yeah, when he says let us. Yes. Well, you see, God reveals Himself, and and we can't understand this because our minds were never created to understand an infinite God. But he, God reveals us, himself to us as one God, and yet he also reveals himself as having three distinct personalities, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so the word God, for example, is a plural word. And when he, or for example, when he said, let us make man in our image, the so, pronouns are plural but on the other hand God repeatedly says I am Jehovah or I am the Lord thy God using a singular pronoun and we can't we can't understand that how there's well, one God and yet revealing himself as three persons okay but at the time that was written all we do is Jesus was with God at that point <laughs> Well, uh, the fact is that uh, uh, Jesus is from everlasting past, and yes, uh, Jesus, when Jesus left heaven and came here uh, to be the Messiah, uh, he was eternal God, and the Bible says in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He was God. He was God. Uh, just uh, just as he was God, uh, just as the Father is God, just as the Holy Spirit is God, but we can't we can't figure that out. So, so we assume that that, that R re re relates to the Trinity. 
I'm sorry? When he says in our image, in your opinion, that's a speaking of the Trinity. Oh, uh, that we are somehow a triune person? No, that God, when he says in our image, that that verse is relating to the Trinity? It's relating to eternal God, who is... Uh, who is revealing himself as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we can't, uh, we can, uh, anytime the Bible talks about God, there's a great mystery. And, and our little minds, uh, which can understand a great many words of the Bible and many concepts of the Bible, as God opens them up to us, but we're not able to understand God, uh, who God really is. Uh, we look at all the language of the Bible and and we have to shake our head and say, I don't understand, but I know it's true because God has declared it. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Campion. Um, I wanted to say that I really enjoy your radio station, and I'm very thankful for it, and I wish you a wonderful Christmas. Um, I wanted to um, ask about talking to our younger kids. Um, I have a seven-year-old nephew who I was explaining um, uh, one day, isn't it beautiful, um, the world that God has made for us? And he says, well, how come the grass is so itchy? And anyway, so you get these uh, different questions. But I, I know the question will be coming, um, why are there some terrible things in the world? And I just wondered um, if you could explain what we might say to the younger kids in regards to that. And I'll uh, take my call on the radio and hang up. Thank you very much. Well, fine. You know, when we talk to the younger children, we talk to them like we talk to an adult because... Uh, uh, God has to apply truth to their hearts, and, and uh, children have a capacity to understand a lot of things that we don't think they have the ability to understand. But here is the problem. When mankind rebelled against God, now God created a perfect world, an absolutely perfect world. God saw everything, and it was very good. And uh, he put uh, in charge of the whole world mankind. He said, be fruitful and multiply. And, uh, and, and he said that with the, he put everything under, uh, under the authority of mankind. They were to rule the world. Well, then mankind rebelled against God. Uh, we, it all began with Adam and Eve, and in principle we were all there in his loins because we all come from the genes, from the bloodline of Adam. And uh, so the, the ruler, mankind, had to come under the wrath of God. They were cursed by God because of their sin. Now we have the strange situation of a perfect world. The animals and the trees and the uh, all the uh, the whole world itself, a perfect world being ruled over by imperfect man, who in turn came under the authority of of uh, Satan, who uh, was given uh, authority to rule over imperfect man, and so God cursed the earth and brought made it subject to. Uh, uh, to viruses and thorns and thistles and uh, and uh, bad things that uh, because uh, 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 because uh, ma mankind uh, uh, who ruled it and 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 Satan who ruled over mankind were under the curse of God and so God brought the whole universe under the curse of God and and uh, uh, that is why we see. Uh, thorns and thistles come up and that's why we have poisonous snakes and that's why we have uh, uh, th uh, volcanoes and earthquakes and things of this nature on top of it mankind himself is in rebellion against God and is is doing ugly things so we have uh, a man killing men and uh, and we have sexual perversion and we have stealing and all kinds of terrible sins going on because mankind himself 
is in rebellion against God. So we have a very, very messed up world, and and uh, it's 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 awful the way it has all developed. But God had a plan, and that is out of all of these miserable. Uh, uh, people who have rebelled against God, which includes every single individual, he decided to save some of them and make them his children. And so they, when they become saved, have a real desire to do the will of God. Uh, Secondly, uh, and they will end up in a new universe eventually where everything is perfect. And also God at the same time will recreate this present universe that is under the curse of God and make it a brand new world where everything is perfect again. And that's what's going to happen when Christ comes on the last day. Uh, As the judge of all the earth, he will destroy this universe with fire and recreate it a perfect world. And there is where he uh, will live in that new heaven and new earth with all those who he has saved who are the true believers and never again will this terrible catastrophe occur of a world coming under the curse of God or mankind rebelling against God but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum yeah Harold how, how is it that um in the second heaven and uh, earth, that there's a guarantee that there's uh, no tears and happiness forever. But in the first heaven and earth, it was all good, but yet uh, sin entered. How is there no? Is there a guarantee that sin won't enter again? And and why couldn't God guarantee no sin in the first uh, heaven and earth? The reason is that when Adam and Eve were created, they were created perfect. But the life they were given was conditional. It would remain beautiful and wonderful as long as they did not disobey God. Uh, But they were created with the potential of being able to rebel against God. But when he saves us, we are reinstated into the kingdom of God, but now we have been given eternal life. That is, uh, we now, there are no conditions. Uh, We will never, never want to sin again in our new resurrected soul and later on in our glorified spiritual body that we'll receive on the last day. We have been given eternal life. Now, that just happens to be the way God has arranged the whole business, that he did not give Adam and Eve eternal life He did give them life, which was perfect, just as eternal life is perfect, but it was not eternal in in character. It was conditioned upon whether they would remain faithful to the commandments of God. (laughs) And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello? Yes. Yes, Miss Aaron. Yes, go ahead with your call. Okay, uh, I've been listening to you for a long time, and I am very interested in the things that you teach us. I just have two questions to ask you tonight. One question is about women in the pulpit preaching. Is there um, is that right? Is that biblical for a woman to preach? Yes, sir. Yeah, well, during the church age, God gave a very, very specific command concerning that because uh, uh, God, of course, was completely aware that uh, of the nature of man, that they want to develop their own ideas. And, and there were a few things in the Bible that were not really clear about this. So in 1 Corinthians 14... God uh, laid the rule down. This is part of the law of God, that when the whole congregation came together, he said in verse 14, uh, 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 let me see, which verse was it? Uh, In 1 Corinthians chapter uh, um, 14, 
been some time since I've <laughs> looked at this, that a woman is uh, not to teach or have, no, that, oh, oh. it's uh, in 1 Corinthians 14, verse, uh, I'll get it, verse 34, okay, it's been quite a while since I looked at this verse. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. You see how plain that is? That, that's a yes, direct I, command. Yes, I do. Okay, I see how plain it is. But in the churches that I go to, they they making it sure that if there's not a man there, that the law will put a woman there to preach until a man is able to uh, step step up. Well, that's the law that that church has developed. They don't they didn't read that in the Bible anywhere. If there's a man there uh, during the church age, when God still recognized churches to uh, 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 to evangelize the world. Uh, this law applies that a woman is not to preach and if there's no man there the congregation better get on their knees and start praying and praying and praying that God will bring a man there to do the preaching but that doesn't give them an excuse now to set up their own kind of a law but I that there women did preach in the Bible do you know about it? well but you see that was the problem God I did indicate, uh, uh, for example, Anna, at the time that Jesus was uh, brought into the temple by Mary and Joseph, then she proclaimed in the temple, or she uh, made a statement there. And so you could say, well, Anna was allowed to do that, so why can't a woman? It is true, however, that when we search the Bible, all the prophets were men, uh, all the, uh, the, the priests were men, all the apostles were men, uh, but there were these uh, curious exceptions, like Anna speaking in the temple. There was a woman judge uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, there were uh, there uh, there was a uh, servant uh, called a de uh, de deaconess, but actually she was a servant in the congregation in Romans chapter 13, verse one, I think. But uh, but. Uh, in order to make sure that uh, that there's no misunderstanding about this, God spelled it out in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34. A woman is to be silent. And so the whole question is, are we going to follow God's law or are we going to modify God's law to suit uh, whatever condition we have? And it's the same and true today. God has now commanded us to come out of the local congregations because the Holy Spirit is not uh, present there any longer, and yet there are those who are saying, oh, yeah, that's true, maybe, for everybody else. But in our church, we're still faithful, and so we can still remain here. What they're doing is they're deciding they can modify the law to suit their particular condition. And we must not do that. We have to be altogether obedient to whatever law God gives, even though we may not like it or not uh, completely understand it. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. How are you doing today? Very well, thank you. I have a, um, a question that I need for you to help me with, and I'm, it's to do with uh, Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. And that's the half hour of silence yeah. that you, you speak up. I'm trying to understand how and where that fits in the great tribulation, if it is the first half of the tribulation or if it's in the second half. And could you um, help explain that to me, please? Well, it is in the first part of the Great Tribulation. There was a half hour of silence, and it coincides with the killing of the two witnesses of Revelation 11 when their bodies lay in the uh, streets of the, uh, the city, which was called uh, Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. It coincides with the language of uh, 
of uh, Matthew 24, verse 24. There will be great tribulation such as the world has never known. It coincides with the loosing of the four angels that held back the winds that were going to bring destruction at the moment that uh, uh, God had finished saving all that he planned to save through the local congregations as we read about it in Revelation 7. Uh, this first part of the tribulation uh, is when there was no gospel anywhere in the world, but after a short period, and from everything we can read in the Bible, that period of time coincides with the 2300 evening mornings of Daniel 8, uh, then we find that God again, uh, and it coincides with 1994, which was a jubilee year, and a uh, the essence of, or the nature of the Jubilee year was to proclaim liberty to the land, and liberty has to do with salvation. And so then, uh, except for the local congregations, uh, again, people, God began to save people all over the world. So that uh, we read in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, I saw a great multitude. Uh, 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 who were uh, without number, which no man could number, and they were robed with white robes. And it's explained there that these were people who came out of great tribulation. And that's what's going on today, right now, uh, outside of the local congregations. And, and the other part of the question is, do you have an idea, or does the scriptures tell us how long the um, the silence was, if it was on um, like months or, or years, or was it the entire uh, first half of the Great Tribulation? Well, it's like I indicated, from everything we can read in the Bible, it, it coincided with the 2300 evening day and mornings of Daniel 8, which would have been about six years and four months. Okay, so that was the full time that there was no, um, no salvation one, available anywhere? No one being saved. The gospel okay. was going out, but God was not blessing it during that period. But right immediately following that, outside of the local congregations, as the gospel continued, the true gospel, that has to be the true gospel, the whole counsel of God, as it went out, uh, people there are a great many people becoming saved. Okay, well, I want to thank you, and you have a very good holiday. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello there, Mr. Camp, and how are you this evening? Very well, thank you. Uh, yes, I'm very glad that I finally made it through to you. I really enjoy your show, and you brought up a lot of interesting points which have really affected uh, my faith and my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. My first question has to do with salvation. Um, <clears throat> I'm uh, really... Um, I've been searching for years to find out if I was saved or not and to make a long story short uh, I've been through legalism and to one end and back to the other and I totally agree with you and family radio that there's nothing that a human being can contribute to their salvation but there's a question that I must ask you because um, I still feel as if I'm hanging out there somewhere um, I know that you say that uh, you know we must wait for the Lord and and that we must stay in the environment of the Bible. Now, here's the question. Uh, what is it exactly that the Lord will do or that the Lord will indicate or that the Lord will uh, cause someone to realize that they'll finally know that they are saved? Now, I know that you said that obeying the commandments is one of them, but you know, apart from believing that Jesus is the Son of God and that He was resurrected, what is it exactly, you know, what was it that you realized that you were really saved? Well, see, the, uh, the word believing on Him, that's, that's, that's a very, very uh, uh, undec indecisive word because uh, the word believe is used in the Bible. Uh, it's always the same word. And, and it, uh, 
Uh, there are those who believe for a while, then they fell away. There are all kinds of people who believe that they're sinners and that Christ went to the cross to pay for sinners, and they, and they believe they've trusted in Christ. But that doesn't prove for a moment that they're saved. We even read of the devils. They believe in God, in, in the fact that there's a judgment day coming. And so the word believe is, is, uh, is uh, we've got to be really careful. That, uh, that's not where the real evidence can be, because we can think we, uh, just because we uh, uh, trust the Bible that these are truths uh, that are true, uh, that doesn't mean that we're a child of God. The test is, and you and you notice that as you ask the question, you kind of, and I'm not, I'm <laughs> just the way we are. Uh, you kind of uh, wave aside the keeping of commandments, because look at First John chapter two, verse three. Uh, these these verses probably say it better than anything else. And hereby. This is First John chapter 2, verse 3. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. And what are his commandments? We know that they're the whole word of God. Now that means if we're going to keep his commandments, it means that we must have, uh, mu must have had received a brand new resurrected soul. That is, we must have become born again. And the Bible says that that which is born of God, that's 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, does not sin, does not sin. And now we still live in a body that lusts after sin, so we can fall into a sin. But the fact is, uh, in our personality, and, and our soul is an integral part of our personality, there is an intense desire I want to do it God's way. I want to do it God's way. Not in order to get myself saved. That's legalism. That's wrong. But because that is my desire. That's where I'm happiest when I am doing it God's way. It's not, it's not like I, I'm hanging in there just trying to do the will of God. That's not salvation. Salvation is I am delightful delighted to do the will of god i'm delighted to learn more from the bible i'm delighted to know more and more about what god's will is for uh for the human race and and uh, learn more and more about judgment day and anything else that god wants to teach because uh, in my new resurrected soul that uh, that that just fits very very perfectly and and so it results also that I I find that I do the will of God far more frequently than I ever 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 did before I was saved. I have become a new creature in Christ. As a matter of fact, the Bible says. So you see that, and and the Holy Spirit witnesses with our spirit that we are sons of God, because the w w Bible is the sword of the Spirit, and it's through the Word of God that we get the assurance of our salvation. I have to say good night. We've come to the end of our time. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you.